Late in January 1975, a 17-year-old German girl named Vera Branders walked out, out onto a stage like this, the Cologne Opera House, capacity 1,400 people, which is you guys. But the auditorium was empty. It was, it was lit only by the dim green glow of the, the emergency exit signs. But this was the most exciting day of Vera Brandes' life. She was the youngest concert promoter in Germany. And she had managed to persuade the Cologne Opera House, this great venue, to invite the brilliant American jazz pianist, Keith Jarrett, to perform a late night concert of improvised jazz. So in just a few hours, Keith Jarrett would walk out onto the same stage he would sit down at the piano with no sheet music, with no rehearsal, he'd begin to play. But this was Vera's first experience introducing Keith to the piano. It wasn't going that well. So Jarrett walked suspiciously around the instrument, played a few notes. Keith Jarrett's producer, Manfred Eicher, came over, played a few more notes. The two of them put their heads together, muttered a little. And then Manfred Eicher came over to young Vera Branders and said, if you don't get a new piano, Keith can't play. Turns out there'd been a mix-up. The Cologne Opera House, which never really rated either 17-year-old promoters or jazz very highly, had managed to supply the wrong instrument. And this wasn't just some kind of pernickety, well, you know, I wanted a Bosendorfer and you gave me a Steinway. It wasn't that. This was a, a beaten-up rehearsal model. So the, the high notes, the treble, the, the felt was all worn away, so they sound really harsh and tinny. The white keys were out of tune, the black keys were sticking, the pedals didn't work, and really the, the worst thing of all was the fact that it wasn't actually a grand piano at all. It was, Vera later said, it was a tiny piano, it was like half a piano. Wouldn't create the volume to reach to the back of the auditorium. So Vera, of course, panicked, got on the phone, tried to arrange a replacement piano, very quickly became apparent that no replacement would be forthcoming. So, she called a piano tuner, asked him to come, do his best, and then she went outside to speak to Keith Jarrett, who was sitting alone in his car in the rain, and she stood there, this bedraggled German teenager, talking to him through his car window, begging him to play. So Jarrett thought about the 1,400 people who were going to show up, looked at this rain-drenched teenage girl, took pity on her, and said, never forget, only for you. And so it was that just a few hours later, Keith Jarrett did indeed walk out on the same stage. He sat down at the unplayable piano in front of 1,400 people, and he began to play. something magical was happening. So Jarrett was avoiding those harsh, tinny upper registers. I mean, he was in the middle of the piano, which gave what he was playing a, a soothing, ambient quality. But he couldn't just play wallpaper music or elevator music, because the, the instrument wasn't loud enough for that. So he was going down to the bass, and he was setting up these rumbling, repetitive riffs, just trying to get enough volume to reach the people at the back. And he, he stood up, and he was 
pounding down on the keys to try to make the piano go louder. So there's this amazing energy and dynamism. And at the same time, the piece is tranquil and soothing. It's absolutely electric. The audience loved it. And audiences continue to love it. Because Keith Jarrett and Manfred Eicher decided they were going to record that concert because they wanted a documentary proof of what a musical catastrophe sounded like. <laughs> and instead, what they got was Keith Jarrett's Cold Concert, the best-selling solo jazz album and the best-selling piano album in history. So Keith Jarrett was handed a mess, and reluctantly, hesitantly, he embraced it and he soared. But I just want you to think for a moment about Keith Jarrett's instinctive reaction. He didn't want to play. Of course he didn't want to play. I mean, none of us would, would want to, to walk out on stage with equipment or tools that were failing around us or, or to be asked to do our job in, in, in possibly distracting environment or with difficult people. We didn't, we, no, we're, we're tidy-minded. We like things the way we like them. We like circumstances to be set up in the right way. So, of course, he didn't want to play. And thank goodness he changed his mind. The argument I want to make today is that all of us, whether we get guilt-tripped into it or not, need to sit down and play the unpiano unplayable piano a little bit more often. We need to embrace these obstacles and power through them and work with them and sometimes even seek them out because they actually help us. They help us be more creative. They help us solve problems. They help us do better work. Now, I realize that may be a hard sell. So for evidence, let me draw on a few different fields. I want to talk about cognitive psychology. I want to talk about computer science, social psychology, and of course, most importantly, rock and roll. But let's start with the cognitive psychology, shall we? So um, we've known for a while that sometimes when you, when you make a task a little bit more difficult, which really goes against the grain, I keep hearing this morning, or make it easy, make it easy, make it easy. Yeah, maybe. Make some things easy, but make some things difficult. When you make things difficult, that can actually bring out the best in people. Let me give you a very simple example done by a uh, research done by a psychologist called Daniel Oppenheimer and some of his colleagues. So Oppenheimer and the research team um, partnered with high school teachers. And they said, OK, you've got various classes, and we want, to, we want you to give some of your classes your standard handouts, which are formatted in, say, um, Helvetica or Times New Roman. Let's see if we can, yeah, Helvetica. So they're formatted in Helvetica, they're straightforward, they're easy to read. Other classes are going to get the same handouts, exactly the same handouts, except they'll be formatted in, say, um, you know, that curvy swish of monotype Corsiva, or maybe the, the sort of the, the dense Germanic Hattenschweiler. I love that font. Or maybe, maybe even, you know what's coming, the zesty bounce, Comic Sans italicized. <laughs> OK. Term goes past. The teachers hand out the end of term exams. And in six different subjects, the kids who've been given the ugly, difficult fonts do better. Why? Not sure exactly why. It may be Hattenschweil is actually easier to read after all. I doubt it. It seems more likely that what's going on is that these more difficult fonts are just slowing the kids down a little bit. Not a lot. They didn't format it in, wi in wingdings, right? Just, <laughs> just a little bit harder. They had to read it a bit more slowly. They felt when they were looking at something that was a challenge, they had to rise to that challenge. They had to process what they were thinking about, make connections, pick up little clues. This is all very subtle. But basically, because it slowed them down, they learned more from the font that was harder to read. Or um, I'll give you another example. 
there's a Harvard psychologist called Shelley Carson who's been testing her students for their, the quality of their attentional filters. What does that mean? So imagine you're in a restaurant, you're trying to have a conversation, and there, there are other conversations happening in the restaurant. Can you filter them out and focus on the conversation you want to have? If you can, you've got good, strong, attentional filters. Or you're, you're trying to do some email, but also there's a television on. Can you, can you filter the television out and focus on the email or not? If you can, strong attentional filters. Now, you would think that having those filters was an advantage, right? Of course it is. But when Shelley Carson administered this test, she found a lot of her students, these are Harvard undergraduates, had quite weak, quite porous filters. They were letting in a lot of noise and distraction. And the students who were in that situation, overwhelmingly, they were the real high achievers, creatively. They were the, if you looked, some of them had published novels, some of them had um, put on stage plays that had received national attention, won prizes, they had an album out. I mean, substantial creative achievements. Almost overwhelmingly, they were the ones with the weak filters. Now, they could think outside the box, right? Because it turns out the box was full of holes. So that's the view from cognitive psychology. What about, um, what about computer science? Because this is all a bit kind of wishy-washy, isn't it? I mean, surely once we get to you know, hard kind of algorithmic techniques, throwing in extra mess, throwing in an extra obstacle, that's not going to help. Well, it turns out it does. So if you take a classic problem that uh, even a computer can't find a solution to, because it's just too complex, the search space is, is, too, is too big. And so you're searching for a solution in this, in this complex problem, um, an approximate solution, something that's good enough. Um, how do you do that? I mean, a classic example of this would be laying out um, components on an integrated circuit. So lots and lots and lots of different ways to lay out components on an integrated circuit that are functionally, that are logically the same, like the, the chip does the same thing. But some of them spread everything out, waste a lot of space, and some of them are very tight, compact, very efficient. And the range of different possible outcomes is so huge, you will never find the perfect way to pack all those components on the chip. All you can do is find something that's good enough. So you, you create a computer algorithm that searches for different ways to pack the circuits on the chip, pack all these components in. And one method that works pretty well is to just ask the computer to search for step-by-step -step solutions. So just swap any two components, for example. Does that make it better? If so, do that. And just repeat, 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 a thousand times, a million times, whatever. And if, it, if the swap doesn't make it better, then look for another swap. Just keep looking for swaps. Make those swaps, looking for these tiny incremental improvements. And that's fine, that works. But you know what makes it work better? bit of randomness. There are lots of different ways to design this kind of algorithm, but most of them involve serious doses of randomness, especially early on in the process. So there's a random restart algorithms, or there are evolutionary algorithms, or there are algorithms that work a little bit like metal cooling down and being annealed, and all sorts of different approaches. But basically, you're throwing in randomness. And the reason you're throwing in randomness is because this step by step by step Look, uh, uh, search for marginal improvements, it'll get stuck eventually. You will take these small, small steps down a blind alley, and that's it. There will be no pair of components you can switch that will improve your silicon chip, and then you're stuck. But if you throw extra randomness in, so every now and then you try these wild leaps, try something totally different, especially early on in the process, that's a much more effective algorithm for most of the kinds of problems we're discussing. And actually, when you think about it, isn't that sort of what happened to Keith Jarrett? I mean, he's a brilliant, brilliant pianist. And took a lot of risks in many ways. He would, he would walk out there every night with a piano and, and just play. No practice, just something different every night. But then again, always the same kind of piano. Always the same instrument. So he's honing his skills, he's perfecting his skills on exactly the same instrument. And then when he's suddenly given a piano that doesn't work very well, he finds something quite new. 
He could have played that piece of music on a good piano, but he didn't because he didn't have to, and it never occurred to him to try. It was only when he had no choice that he discovered there was a whole new musical range out there. So we've looked at cognitive psychology. We found that obstacles and interruptions and distractions can actually help us solve problems, make us more creative. We looked at computer science. We found if we're searching for solutions in a complex space, whether it's a silicon chip or a piece of music, throw in some randomness, helps you find better solutions. What about social psychology? Okay, so social psychology is the psychology of dealing with other people, which is something I personally find very difficult because I'm an economist. You know, um, we don't really do people. But, um, you know, I try, I try. And so social psychologists have been looking at how people interact with friends and strangers. Because let's face it, there is nothing more disruptive and annoying than other people. And you're probably aware, there's, there's a lot of research showing that um, when you have a diverse team, that can help in, in certain kinds of problems, important kinds of problems, because they have different perspectives, they spot different problems, they can, you, they've, maybe it's a different age, maybe different races, genders, national backgrounds, training, whatever it is, a diverse group, group of people will find a different range of solutions. Uh, and there's some really good work on that. But the work I'm most interested in doesn't consider that sort of situation. It's done by Catherine Phillips, who's a psychologist at Northwestern University, and a couple of her colleagues. And what she did was to give people murder mystery problems. So, you know, you've got a setup, some witnesses, alibis, evidence, and it's multiple choice, right? There are three possible bad guys who might have done the murder. And you have to read through this package of evidence and figure out how did it, who did it. And the interesting thing about this problem is basically everybody comes to this problem with the same information. They have everything they need to solve the problem in front of them, and nothing else they've learned is really going to help. Okay? So it's not the standard case for diversity. But what Catherine Phillips did was, um, first of all, she asked people to try and solve these problems by themselves. 20 minutes, here's the, here's the information, what do you find? And it's hard. So fewer than 50% of people get this right. It's multiple choice, remember? Three, three options. So fewer than 50%, it's not great. When you put people together in teams, team of four friends, the success rate goes up, it's just over 50%. But Catherine Phillips did something else. So instead of assembling teams of four friends, she assembled teams of three friends and a stranger. Now, that shouldn't really help, right? Because no one's got any fresh information. It's not like there were three statisticians and in comes the anthropologist with a totally different perspective. No, basically, they're just students. It's just these three students know each other and this other student doesn't know them. They're given the same information. The success rate absolutely soared, went up to 75%. In other words, they, they actually were making progress in solving this problem. And what seemed to be happening was it was just the sheer awkwardness of having to cope with the gooseberry in the room. So because, because you don't know this person, you have to spell things out a bit more carefully. You can't let lazy assumptions slide. You, you're just a bit more cautious in how you phrase everything and how you query everything, and you're more deliberate in your communication. And all of that, it turns out, re really, really helps. But what's fascinating about Catherine Phillips' work is she asked people afterwards, how did you feel about it? And the groups of four friends, who remember, really suck at this problem, they said, it was great. I had a great time. Do you think you solved the problem? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Good quality of conversation and debate? Yeah, yeah, it was great. Everything's cool. I had a blast. When she talked to the three friends and the stranger, did you enjoy yourselves? Not really. How awkward. Good, was it a good conversation, good quality of conversation? No, I, I just don't think, I don't think we were really able to communicate. Okay. Do you think you solved the problem? No. Yeah. <laughs> the success rate was way higher. And I think this really exemplifies the problem. Remember, Keith Jarrett didn't want to play the unplayable piano. Of course not. Right? And these people didn't want to work with a stranger because they thought it wouldn't help. 
And even after it had helped, they still didn't acknowledge that. The people who were with their friends, feeling comfortable and failing, thought that they were succeeding. I think that's a problem. And I, and I, I realized that we often have to be forced into this stuff. We don't embrace it. A really simple example. A few years ago, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to talk about any recent political developments that may feel like enormous kind of messes that have just been imposed on us, okay? There's no... <laughs> Supply your own punchline, you know, they don't seem like a great idea to me, but then the unplayable piano didn't seem like a great idea to Keith Jarrett. You never know. Um, Let's just go for a really simple, uncontroversial example. In London, um, a couple of years ago, there was a strike, a tube strike, that closed down not all of the underground stations, but some of the underground stations. And um, the overground stations are still working. The bus is still working. And so commuters had to figure out how to get to work. And so, you know, you're trying to get to Barbican, you know, maybe, maybe more gates closed, but you could still go to Farringdon, or maybe you could take the train into Liverpool Street Station and walk, it's not that far, or the DLR to Bank, that might work, or, or you know, maybe there's a bus, and you, you, know, you, you find these different options. So three economists got hold of the, the Oyster card data, basically tracking everyone's journeys, and they looked at what had happened, and they identified regular commuters, people who took exactly the same journey to work, every morning, and exactly the same journey home again, every evening, completely unchanged for two weeks solid before the strike, and who then changed their route during the strike. And what they found was that a substantial minority of them, just 5% or so, but it's quite a lot of people, never changed back. You would think, if there's anyone in the world who's really got it nailed to perfection, it's the commuter on his or her route to work. <laughs> it, all you do is close down half the tube uh, stations in London, and one in 20 people go, oh, actually, there's been this better way all along. <laughs> Never tried it. Never tried it. But we have to be forced into it, which is why, which is why I need to talk about rock and roll. So, while I was writing my book, which I might subtly put up here, <laughs> I interviewed a guy who you might know, called uh, Brian Eno. So Brian Eno is, is, is this amazing figure in the background of pop music. He had a hand in maybe um, a quarter of the best albums of the 1970s. He developed his own style, ambient music. He created Another Green World, which Prince said is the greatest album he'd ever heard. Um, he worked with Phil Collins. He worked with uh, U2, Coldplay, Philip Glass, Twyla Tharp. He worked with everybody. Most famously, he worked with David Bowie. And I spoke to, to Brian about the experience of, of working with Bowie. Uh, and one of the things that they did, they worked together on three albums in the 1970s in Berlin. One of the things they did is, is that Eno would, whenever people got stuck, he would pull out a weird card from a deck he called the Oblique Strategies, she created with a friend. And these cards would just make these weird demands on, on the musicians. So this one says, uh, work at a different speed. Um, use unqualified people. Actually, there's an example of that. So while they were making the Lodger album, at one point, um, Adrian Bellew, brilliant guitarist, comes in to play a completely gonzo guitar solo for a piece of music he's never heard. They won't even tell him what key it's in. They're just like, the music's going to come through the headphones. Just play, just play. It's Boys Keep Swinging, by the way. You listen to the guitar solo and Boys Keep Swinging. It's unbelievable. Adrian Ballou said it's like a, it was like a freight train coming through my mind. He had no idea what was happening to him. But one of the things he noticed was that one of the greatest guitarists in the world, Carlos Alomar, was on the drums looking grumpy. <laughs> Make a sudden, destructive, unpredictable action. Incorporate. The thing about these cards, musicians hated them. Phil Collins worked on Another Green World, 
At one point, he was reduced to hurling beer cans across the studio because Brian Eno was pissing him off so much. Carlos Alomar said, this, this, is, this experiment is stupid. But the results speak for themselves. They're great albums. And decades later, Carlos Alomar himself now uses the oblique strategies. And he tells his students to use them. He says, it was like being slapped in the face. But now I realize I need my students to understand how I felt and that freshness. But we're never going to embrace it willingly. So Eno told me the oblique strategies were originally not a deck of cards. They were a list, a list on the studio wall. And you would just look down, and you'd pick one off the list. But of course, what you would do was pick whatever was the least frightening and least disruptive suggestion, which of course misses the point entirely. And he realized if the oblique strategies were to work, they had to be drawn at random and forced on people. And that was how Brian Eno made himself you know, the ugly font or the disruptive stranger. He knew he had to trick people into it or force people into it. I think that's true for all of us. However we do it, whether it's rolling a dice, whether it's stepping out into a room full of people we don't know and shaking someone's hand and starting a conversation, or whether it's a guilt trip from a German teenager. All of us from time to time need to sit down and try to play the unplayable piano. Thank you very much.